Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's video, I'm going to do a show and tell on the brand new DJI Mini 3 Pro drone. And what I'd like to do in this video, it's a complete overview of the drone and slight comparisons to the original Mini 2, just so you understand the differences between that drone and this drone. And I'll go through every aspect of it and point out some of the cool things that DJI's built into this brand new drone. So stay tuned and I'll take a closer look next. The Mini 3 Pro drone has a completely redesigned airframe, which is a radical departure from the three previous models of Mini drones released by DJI that included the Mavic Mini, the Mini SE, and the Mini 2. Now I've got a Mini 2 here for comparison purposes, and when I set this down next to the Mini 3, you'll notice pretty quickly that the older airframe is a little bit longer, it's a little bit skinnier, and it's also lower to the ground. I think it's absolutely amazing that the engineering teams at DJI were able to incorporate all of the upgrades for the Mini 3 Pro and still keep this airframe under 249 grams. When you consider you've now got obstacle avoidance incorporated, you've got a brand new design for the gimbal with a larger camera, and still it's under 249 grams. Now, as I go through the overview of the Mini 3 Pro, I may occasionally refer back to the Mini 2 because I always like to understand what the current version offers and what's been changed in the new version and why, from an engineering perspective, you change that and what benefit does it provide. So I'll refer back occasionally to the Mini 2. The first thing I want to mention is the way the arms support the drone. So if you look back on the original airframe design, uh, you've got this leg coming down from the top arm, which did two things. It supported the drone in addition to these feet in the back, but it also made it a little clumsy to open the arms because if you open the bottom arm first, you couldn't actually open the top arm. So you had to remember to fold the top arms out first and then fold back the bottom arms. But the key here is that some of the weight of the drone was borne by that particular arm in addition to this back here, which put some stress on the arms. If it came down hard, you might rock that arm a little bit. So that's been changed in the Mini 3 Pro. On the new design, there's no weight on any of these arms, and you can fold them out in any order you'd like. So I can fold the bottom ones out first, then the top ones, or I can fold the top ones out first and then the bottom ones. But the key here is that all the weight to support this drone is on the bottom, on these four feet. So it actually lands down on these four feet. There's little rubber pads in there for some shock absorption. And it's just, I think, a better design for landing the drone. Now, one thing I do want to point out, because I always like to build some physics <laughs> or some science into these conversations, is that when you're folding the arms out, you'll find that they're spring-loaded. So as you're folding these out, right about mid-travel right there, the built-up tension in that spring wants to release, and it wants to spring all the way open on its own. Don't ever let go of that arm, because if you remember back to science class, a wound spring has what's called potential energy in it, which wants to be dissipated, and it's gonna turn into kinetic energy when it's moving, so that's energy in motion. As you're swinging this open, right about here, it wants to dissipate all that energy and swing this arm open, and the challenge there is when it reaches the end of travel, there's a lot of kinetic energy that has to be dissipated. That's gonna travel right down the arm into the joint and crack that joint over time. So the simple answer is always hang on to this all the way to the end to travel, never let it snap open on its own. All right, so let's start on the top of the drone because there's some interesting things up here to look at. For starters, you have a power button on the back. You can't check the level of the battery by the battery. You have to check it through this button. So the battery's in the drone. If you tap that button, it'll tell you how much of a charge is on that battery currently. Each of those LEDs represents 25%. If it's flashing, it's less than 25. So if you have three of them with one flashing, you're somewhere between 75 and 100%. If you want to turn the drone on, you'll tap it and hold it. It'll go through its power on self-test routine. It'll move the gimbal around, make sure you take the gimbal cover off. It'll move the gimbal around to make sure it's got freedom of motion. It'll check the electronics inside to make sure everything's ready to go. It'll start looking for the controller. You'll also see two new vents on the back. The venting on this is really important because there's a lot of electronics inside there that gets really, really warm when it's working. You've got you know, motion sensors, I should say obstacle avoidance sensors. You've got a new camera. You've got a new processor that can handle 150 megabits a second from the video coming back. So everything in there is drinking electrons and getting a little bit warm. So they need to keep it cool. These are really important because the air comes in the front, flows over those printed circuit boards, and comes out these exit vents in the back. You'll also notice some sensors up front. Now, the design of this, it really borrows heavily from the uh, Air 2S because the Air 2S has up sensors and forward sensors. This one doesn't have up sensors, but it's got forward sensors right here. And these are binocular sensors. And binocular sensors are important because what they're doing, just like with binoculars, is they're looking in front of you to give you some depth perception. Because if you cover one of your eyes, you can't really tell how far away something is because you've got one eye, you can't get a depth perception out of it. The minute you open that second eye, you can tell roughly how far something's away. So these binocular sensors are doing the exact same thing. They're looking in front of the drone for any kind of obstruction. And if you have APAS turned on, they're actually looking to build a map of what's in front of it. And its only job when APAS is turned on is to avoid the solid object. So it's creating a map, looking for gaps that it can get through to avoid a tree or a building or something else in front of it. So binoculars up front. 
What's really interesting in the design is they don't have rear-facing sensors in the back, which most drones do. That would have made it a little clumsy and it would have really, I think, impacted the aerodynamic design of it and would have impacted these vents as well. So what they've done, again, clever engineering, is they've built the rear-facing sensors right here that look down the body of the drone and look behind it. Now, your first question would probably be, and it was mine as well, how effective can they be knowing the body's in the way and these things are in the way? I can't see a lot behind it. You would be astounded at how good it is in reverse because I've got another clip I'm posting this week where I actually try to crash the drone. I, I really tried hard to crash the drone, flying at full speed into a stand of trees in the Pine Barrens, and it would not crash. Now, I expected that in the front because I have the two binoculars up front, but I was really worried about it backing out from that crowded tree stand. And I'm telling you, it was just as good in reverse as it was going forward. So these are the forward-facing sensors. These are the rear-facing sensors. You have two more on the bottom right here. Again, another set of binocular sensors to look below it. So as you're coming down on something, these will draw a map of the ground below it and make sure that it doesn't crash into something. Now, I'll take the cover off in a minute. You have two more sensors right here that are VIO sensors, and they help when it gets close to the ground so it can keep level flight. Or if you're flying inside, those are, those are kicked in as well. All right, so let's see what else we've got. Uh, I've had a few questions about the propellers. People want to know if they can use the Mavic 2 propellers with the Mavic 3. <laughs> the answer should be obvious. Absolutely not. They're different sizes. There's no way you're going to transfer them across. Do the covers fit? I haven't tried it yet. I'm going to try that later today, but the way they mount are a little bit different as well. So I'm assuming there's going to be different motor covers. I like using motor covers. I don't like to leave windings exposed like that. So I'm sure there'll be motor covers coming for this. Now, as far as the uh, propellers go, you're going to change them exactly like you do on the current Mavic products and the mini products, or I should say the mini products, where there are two screws that hold the propellers in. Now, a couple of cautions here. You should understand that the propellers have personalities. There's a clockwise set and a counterclockwise set, and you'll find that these two are the same style and these two are the same style because it's got to balance itself in the air. When you change the propellers, you'll find that in the package, there'll be new screws and new propellers. Always change these as a pair because they're matched at the factory, they're balanced together, and always take the screws that come out throw them out, throw out the old propellers, throw out the screws, use the new propellers and the new screws because on the end of those screws is a tiny bit of blue Loctite. When you tighten these down, it actually, from the compression, will actually uh, ignite that Loctite, not ignite it, but activate the Loctite to hold those screws in there. Now you could hang on to the old screws and use a dab of blue Loctite in them, that's totally up to you. But since they come with new screws, just use the new screws when you change them, but always change two propellers at the same time. All right, let's take a look around the outside of the body. Nothing on either side there. You'll notice there's a couple of scratches on there. Th those, came from, <laughs> those came from my crash testing. I actually was successful to crash it, but I had to be a real knucklehead to actually crash. And I'll, I've got a clip coming where I explain the goofy thing I did to crash the drone, but it's, it's been crashed a few times. Um, some dirt on the side there as well. All right, on the bottom of the unit, again, I'd mentioned these four feet. You'll see another ventilation hole right there because the air flows above and below through that front chamber and it cools below it and it cools above it. So it's keeping the inside electronics really, really cool. One of the questions I got a lot from people was, okay, a lot of other small drones get really, really hot when they're shooting 4K at 60 frames a second. Does this drone get hot? I have an entire clip where I'm talking about that. The short answer is, yes, it will get hot if you let it sit and don't actually fly it because it's designed to fly. And part of the heating schema is to put it up in the air and have air pass over the electronics and pull the heat out the back as it flies. If you're not flying it, it's going to get warm. So don't, don't turn it on unless you're going to fly it. Turn it on, connect up to your controller, and put it up in the air and cool it down that way. All right, so let me take the gimbal cover off. And again, this is kind of a cool design. There's two little posts that stick down into the VIO sensors. You just lift it up there, pops right off the front, and you're good to go. Now, here are the two optical sensors I mentioned. These are binocular sensors, which are visual. These are uh, VIO sensors, which is, I'm going to mess this up, but it's visual uh, inertial odometry. I knew I'd get it eventually. I just had to think about it. But anyway, these are time of flight sensors that are ricocheting infrared signals off the ground below it. And then they're timing how fast those signals come back to be picked up. And it has a real good idea of where it is off the ground. These kick in probably under 20 feet. So if you get down lower than 20 feet, these guys kick in. These are still being used, but these are primarily what keeps it from crashing into the ground. One word of caution, these can get confused if you get to a reflective surface, if you're over snow or if you're over water, and you get down too close to that, these can actually get confused. And I've had situations where the drone thinks it's further away from the water than it actually is and take a nice dive. So be really careful when you're flying over water or other reflective surfaces. All right, so let's take a look at the front because I am blown away by this camera system they built into here. Now, the, the gimbal assembly is radically new. Uh, before I talk about that, though, look behind the camera. You see the vents up top there and the vents down the bottom there? 
there. I don't know if you can get a good look at those or not. I'll bring it a little closer. That's where the air comes in because as you're flying this, you're pushing it through the air. So the air goes through the drone, comes out those ventilation slots in the back and the bottom, and cools the electronics inside. All right, back to the camera. The camera itself is a genius design in a lot of ways. For starters, it can flip vertically. So if you want to do, you know, if you're a TikToker, or you want to do those vertical shots, you can actually film and you can take pictures in a vertical position. There's one button on the controller to hit to do that, so you can flip it vertically. They've also built in the ability to vary the camera down completely straight or up 60 degrees. So just like a lot of the other drones that had that upward motion, which some of the DJI drones did it up to 30 degrees, but I can take this up to 60 degrees, that required a change in the airframe. That's why this gap is right here, so it can look up between those two arms and actually look above it. And that can be really handy for a couple of reasons, because the, the vertical shooting just gives you another you know, trick in your bag that you can use when you're filming. If you're a TikToker or you like to do Instagram photos or for whatever reason you want to do a portrait shot, you can flip it in vertical mode. But I'll tell you, this upward motion of the gimbal just gives you so many more creative options when you're filming things like waterfalls or tall trees or you want to get a look up at the moon. It's a beautiful design. And, and that's, again, a radical departure from the way the uh, gimbals were designed for other drones. So I hope we see that in all the drones going forward because, man, I like that design. And I think that was all I really wanted to talk about. Oh, let me talk about the back, I almost forgot. So on the back of the unit, uh, the battery comes out by pressing these two buttons, one on either side, you can pull it out. And again, there's two batteries available for this. You'll know the difference between them because one has 249 grams on it. That's the smaller battery, the lightweight battery. If you use that battery, it'll keep it under 249 grams. What I have here is the plus battery, which will actually raise the uh, weight above the 249 grams, but I get a lot more flight time out of it, so I like these bigger batteries. You'll push it in, you'll hear it snap, you know it's closed. And then there are two more things on the back you need to pay attention to. Right above that battery compartment is the micro SD card slot. You can slide your micro SD card in there. That's where all the recording takes place. And to the left of that is a USB-C port. Now that's used for a few things. You can actually charge the battery in the drone by connecting that to an external charger, typically 30 watts or higher. If you can use a QC or PD charger, which are quick charging chargers, it'll charge that even faster. It can also be used to connect to a computer to transfer the files from the drone over to the computer. And you can use it as well with the computer to update the firmware. I like to do the over-the-air firmware updates from the controller. It just seems like it works better for me, but you can use a computer to do those updates as well. And that's pretty much it. Now I have to say, I was expecting a lot from this drone in design, and uh, every change they made from the Mini 2 to the Mini 3, for me, is, is a major upgrade. Now, I love the Mini 2. There's a lot of reasons why I'll still fly the Mini 2. I think a lot of people are going to benefit from using the Mini 2, but I, I just, I admire the engineering changes that were made in this one, and I think when I look at this compared to this, it, it's a major evolutionary change, and I think what you're looking at here is the airframe that's gonna be used for most of the models going forward for probably the next five years. If in fact they come out with a Mini 4, Mini 5, this will probably be the airframe they use, but what a major change between the two. I hope that show and tell was helpful, and I know there's been a lot of unboxing videos already posted on the brand new Mini 3 Pro, but I tried to make this one a little more interesting by not only giving you a closer look at the drone and explaining the connections and indicators, but also looking at the engineering changes that were made between the Mini 2 and the Mini 3 and why those engineering changes were made and what benefits they provide to you. I also tried to answer some of the questions we've gotten over the last couple of weeks and pass along some of the tips and tricks that I've picked up with flying this drone over the last couple of weeks as well. Now, if I've missed a question that you have, please drop that in the comments below and I promise I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. I'm also putting together a clip where I answer the top 10 most popular questions, so maybe I'll include it in that clip as well. And I wanna spend as much time as I can answering all the questions you have to understand if this is the right drone for you. Now, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, what are you waiting for? Hit that icon down there and join the Drone Valley family because I have an entire series started for the Mini 3 Pro and I think I've got 15 or 16 clips already started and I'm going to continue to post those and believe me I've tested every aspect of this drone. I do comparisons with it against other drones. I take it out and test all the features and functions so if you're interested in this drone hit that subscribe button and join the family and that way you won't miss a clip. Also stay tuned to the channel because I not only have clips coming on the Mini 3 Pro but I've got a ton of other high-tech gear that you're going to be interested in that I'll be talking about in the channel. So thank Thanks an awful lot for watching. I hope you found this helpful. And until next time, happy flying.